What's up everybody and welcome back to Building the Dream RR Buildings Build Series. My name's Kyle and I'm going to take you through the steps of framing the walls today. So we're getting our story pole set up and I know you guys have seen us do that before but what's a little bit different on this one is since our wall sticks up six inches usually we add to the bottom of the grade board whatever that difference is in our brackets. We're actually going to subtract that now so like right here I got six and five eighths. What I'm going to do, I'm going to hold my tape measure at 6 and 5 eighths, then measure all the way up to 18 feet, holding this at 6 and 5 eighths. That's going to give me my heel measurement. That's the, that's the place right where the truss is going to set. And that is where we're going to designate our, our constant on our story pole. So what I've done is I've marked up using math. I've subtracted so that the bottom of this board is my first wall girt. And I did that because I've only got a 16 foot piece of lumber. Uh, my longer 18s and 20s don't come till tomorrow. So from here up is 1411, my first nailer. Ooh, Zach, that ain't right, dude. I just realized that's wrong. Dang it. So what I just got done figuring out, and I was actually struggling a little bit, just because our post situation is a little unique. Typically, um, the bottom of our post is very close to grade, but with a concrete wall having a six inch curb, I always have to keep reminding myself to uh, subtract 16 inches from my dimension. So, you know, my heel height is not 18 feet, it's actually 17 foot six inches from our grade, which is on our um, on our top of our concrete wall. So what I've also got to do is I'm we're going to have a lean-to that's going to go down both sides of this building, which means I've got to put some header material because whatever reason our um, our lean-to trusses are 10 foot on center, and that is so the customer can get in between our post at 10 foot center instead of running a bunch of headers. Uh, I still like to center notch our post and have our trusses set in that center notch. I think it's a lot stronger than being set on top of a header. So what that means is our posts are 10 foot on center, our trusses are 10 foot on center on our lean twos, but that means they're not gonna line up with our post on our building, which are eight foot on center. Uh, they will, you know, at 40 foot and at 80 foot, but that's only one post in the middle. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a two by 12 header top and bottom of that truss so that we can put a hanger and connect it. Uh, so I just got done figuring that out for our sidewalls because we forgot to do it on our story pole. And I'm sure you'll see that process once we start building our walls. You're gonna see all that two by 12 header and now you know what it's for. So I know we've done the story pole thing, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit how we do this top. You can see our post have this center notch. And what I do is I have Ohio Timberland send us the top four foot of the center loose that way it's not glued in and we can remove it because what I'm going to do is once our story pole has defined exactly where our heel height is I can square this across I'm going to go ahead and cut this block Now this block is going to go and sit right where our heel of our truss is going to be. So now you can see the truss will sit in this pocket. Now this, this building is a little bit different. This is a two ply truss. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to cut this other ear off and then it'll get set right on top of these two plies and uh, bolted through. So hopefully that makes sense there. Then we're just going to come off and I should have this on our story pole, but I don't have a long enough board on site yet. We're going to come up 19 inches and pitch cut this ear off, and that's where our uh, the top of our truss, the top of our purlins, our tails, everything planes in so it's nice and, nice and straight. And we'll go ahead and fasten this, put some 20 pennies in it, and it'll be ready to go. Getting these walls laid out, and typically we're going to build this on the inside but we needed room so we went ahead and threw the post here for now. Uh, customer is running some gravel for us. We got a nice place to work so as soon as that's done we'll slide these in. So we'll go ahead and set these columns right in those pockets. Build our wall like you've seen us do before. This is when 
the efficiency of doing it this way really kicks in because the bigger the building, the more repetition you can do and knock out efficiently, that is when you are going to really make money. And in the end, man, I mean, I love what I do, but it is a business. I got other mouths to feed other than my own, so my passion can be fueled by building, but I need to fill their bellies with money. So um, that's what really drives a lot of this efficiency stuff is in the end, if you're running a business, you wanna, you wanna be profitable. As you can see, we start to pull these posts in just as the customer who's an excavator goes ahead and drops some gravel, thankfully, and he's spreading that out while we're prepping this wall so we can get it built, get it put together, and get it stood up. But until we get some gravel in there, that sand, I'm afraid, is going to swallow our equipment whole. So thankfully, he's able to do that for us kind of at the drop of a hat, and then it's off to the races, laying the walls out, getting everything where we want it so we can bring in the nail gun and get the framing going and i didn't show it but all this lumber has already been pre-cut and marked so we know exactly where it goes <laughs> it's time to bust out the jumbo nailer time to frame up some walls best time for us it's like instant gratification once all the work has been done and prep work is finalized with cutting and prepping and laying out up to the nail gun now. Even though we lay out our post eight foot on center when we put them on the ground, that doesn't mean you don't have to persuade them exactly where you want them as you're framing. Now what's special about the jumbo nailer from Fasco is that it shoots up to a six and three eighths inch ring shank nail. I don't know what that is for metric, but it's a big freaking nail and it's amazing. And when it comes to nailing off headers or LVLs, let me tell you, it is money well spent because it will save your elbow. Now that we have the whole wall built, what we did was we put splice joints in here, so wherever these S's are, you can see Kyle messed up right here and he nailed it because he was getting too excited. So I gotta pull that nail, but that's what Greg's doing here. He's pulling out our temporary nails and we do that so we can ensure that everything is, you know, put together properly and we come back, we pull the splice nails out and then that's where we'll join it once we stand this. So we'll stand this, these five posts and then we'll stand these four posts and put them together. Time to get that JLG, put it to work. Well, this is for that guy on YouTube that said he wasn't gonna watch my channel anymore because it was too perfect. Well, I just messed up. I wasn't supposed to nail this, I did. This is our splice joint, so just like any good remodeler, I'm gonna bust out the saws off. Dude, those carbide teeth on the saw saw is where it's at. Okay. There, we're not perfect. I'm 
I'm pretty sure it's at this point that I'm realizing that I wish I would have been lifting this wall from the inside. It just makes it more difficult when you're lifting it from the outside because of the way the angles are, the way you have to be really careful not to pull the wall right off the concrete wall. And um, for being the first time using this lift and trying to get the controls figured out, this probably took me three times longer than it normally would. But I just wanted to play it safe and make sure that everything went smoothly, and I think it did. I don't like lifting walls from the outside. I don't have a good view of where my angles are at, but this was nice and smooth. It wasn't jerky, so that's... Oh. What is wrong with my fan, Greg? What is wrong with my fan? That is literally life. I don't know why that fan doesn't work, but we're going to have to figure that one out. All right, time to, time to do it. So now that we've got the wall, the wall up here in the bracket, all we're going to do now is we're, we've got our chalk line on here. We're just going to line this up with the edge of the chalk line, put our Stabila plate level on it, which is going to give us max efficiency in you know spreading out the, the distance to level it up and then we're going to fasten it these are our spacs five sixteenths i do believe legs is what these are uh three inch i don't know if that's true Right there, man. That'll... All right, Zach, what do you like, dog? Your way, Zach? Good. Now once we get the first section of wall up, I feel like it's probably a lot of the same. The only difference is once you have multiple pieces of a wall getting put up, you have to splice them in and I didn't really show that in video form, but you kind of just saw it in the time lapse. Um, it just takes a little bit of work and you got to kind of push the girts out of the way so that you can almost bring the two walls together tight and then you can kind of start at the bottom and nail them as you go up and then sometimes you have to use the machinery to lean the wall together and that kind of brings everything together and makes it nice and tight so one thing that i was going to talk about was um, the jumbo nailer so this process we used to all you know three two three of us however many guys were on site we would all take a post and work the wall girts up one at a time, swinging two 20-penny ring shank galvanized nails into each connection. And 
that was a lot of work. Now we can be running multiple things at once, all while one guy is running the nail gun and either the other guy's helping move the post around so that they hit their center marks, or sometimes I just run the whole thing by myself with just the nail gun and it has really increased efficiencies, which most people are going to say, well, yeah, Kyle, a nail gun is way better than pounding them by hand. The problem is try to find a nail gun that will sink 20 penny ring shank four inch nails it's they are not common so you know we don't we can't just use a pas load or a hitachi framer you know it's got to be the right kind of nail for the engineering in the building have you guys noticed how much easier quicker smoother the lifts are when i'm on the inside of the building it's just something about maybe the visual uh, representation of what the posts look like when I'm lifting it or how my straps look like because I can see if I'm you know if my boom is out in front of the lift or if it's behind the lift and that helps me know if it's gonna slide off of the wall or in or out of the brackets but uh, notice that you know we're not even done installing this wall and we've already got the layout going on the end wall and you see here what we're doing is we're lining up the post ends in the brackets on the walls that you can't see and the other ends we're measuring the eight foot center off the outside wall i know i've talked about how the columns are all the same and then i just go ahead and add a center ply in the middle for our extensions and hopefully you can see this what we've done is i've got my heel marked and i use that to determine the height to the top of my truss so i know i've got a 15 and a half inch heel and at this post, I'm going to have three and three-eighths of an inch rise. So I've taken the dimension between the heel and my pocket, which is 17 and three-quarters. I've added three and three-eighths. I come up with four, eight, and seven-eighths. And then I cut a two-by-eight in this case because my columns are two-by-eight. And I'll put this in the middle ply of the post. Obviously that's not where it's gonna go. And then I'll fasten that off. That way I get lumber all the way up to the top cord. So it's kind of a continuous connection all the way down. And you can see as it goes up the peak, they get longer. This board's 10 foot long. So uh, just a little bit something extra. And instead of ordering a column that goes all the way to the post where it's not really necessary, we do this. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm assuming at this point you might kind of be bored with the building of the walls. I left this clip in here really because I loved the view. I loved the clouds coming in and out. I loved just the process, the work. We're building, we're working, but uh, just the scenery. I don't know. Something about working in the Midwest. I sure love it. I'm just about ready to stand the end wall up. And what's a little bit tricky about the end wall is that the posts get longer as they get towards the peak which means they're heavier which means the balance is a little bit off but we've done it a couple times so now you can see here these extensions that we put in that's so it makes the path of the top cord of the truss so hopefully that makes sense now we'll stand this and then we'll put our corners in and we'll fit you know we'll feather in all these boards that connect now you can definitely notice as i lift this wall section how kind of awkward it is uh, definitely a lot more weight there on the left side because of the difference in height of the post and the amount of weight in the material. But we got it set, thankfully, and when we went and did this next section, we definitely picked it a little bit differently and it went a lot smoother. But now that we've got that back end wall done, we can stand these corner posts and feather our boards in to connect everything. And this really locks the walls down nice and sturdy and we feel a lot better. And this also means that we're getting really close to the time of installing that end truss. So I know I've talked about it in previous posts, but I don't think I really showed the close-up detail. So our side walls, which are usually the eaves of the building, um, well, they're always the eave side of the building, not the gable side. We always run those the full dimension. So at eight foot on center, our posts are eight foot on center, which means these wall girts are 16 foot exactly, okay? And then what we do is on our end wall, even though this is still eight foot on center, we come in with a seven foot, 10 and a half. We cut this one shy and that way they line up. I'm gonna be working on this door jam here. These two columns for this nine foot wide, eight foot tall garage door. It's just for pickup trucks, maybe quads. Our columns 
are four and a half inches. So this is gonna be four and a half plus we're gonna do another inch and a half. So it's gonna bring it out to a total of six inches. And the reason we're doing that is our column is a three ply, but then we're gonna bring another fourth ply down because our concrete finished floor height is somewhere about right here, six inches down from here. So what the customer wanted was a six inch curb on the inside of his building. That way when he's washing, you know, washing the floor, washing anything, it goes up against that concrete, can be easily cleaned. So what that means for us is we need to bring some material down on the inside jam so that we can flash it properly, make it trimmed, make it look nice. Nobody wants to see this raw concrete at the bottom of their door jam. And it'll help make it close a lot better on the backside. So if you look behind me here, this is the last corner post and these two jam posts. Once those get up, we'll have we'll have mainly the structure done other than the front wall. But the front wall we never do until all of our trusses are up. And we do that so that it, it gives us access in and out of the building without having to maneuver around posts and all that stuff. So we'll go ahead and we'll finish this corner behind me here and then we'll start hanging trusses. It's gonna be a little tricky because we just found out that our scissor lift doesn't get through the sand around the job site. It's basically like you're on a beach here, which uh, we're gonna have to do something about. We're gonna have to lay some gravel or do something because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna work this whole job site without using my scissor lift. That would be ridiculous. Now back to that jam column. Uh, I showed the concrete was off a little bit. So what I'm doing is I'm gonna run my saw through this six inches on the bottom of this ply that's going to be applied to the inside of that door which is going to give us our fourth ply and i'm just going to run the the saw make a bunch of curves a lot of curves and i probably didn't have to do this many but i didn't really have like a multi-tool or something handy to make a real nice clean um i don't even know what you call that we just basically had to remove some of the material because inch and a half wasn't going to work so this was kind of the, one of the tricks somebody taught me once, just make a ton of little cuts, and it actually works pretty well. So whenever we do a garage door opening on a foundation wall, we always run a fourth ply on the inside so we can trim this out. We get our three plies up on the concrete, and then this fourth ply. Concrete guy was a little bit off. You can see the line down there where I wanted it cut, um, but no big deal. This is just for trim, so we went ahead and we notch that out on this side we should be good this should run down nice so you can see up here what we've done now that greg's closing it up we go ahead and run this up to our header this inside fourth ply and then we put our in-betweener spacer board on our header we fasten that on top gives it a nice connection and then we're going to come in with our 2 by 12 header being a nine foot door no big deal We'll use a bunch of 2 by 12 inside, outside, and get it nice and strong. Now, one thing that's different in post frame versus stick frame is our headers aren't plied. We don't put them together. We usually just stack them on the outside of the post. It gives us a lot of places to secure them, too. There we go. We got everything framed up for the small garage door. Only 8 foot tall. It's going to look a little bit odd on this tall wall, but it'll all work out once we get done with the lean-to. You can see here, I mean, we've basically gone through and put everything in and we're hoping well we're actually assuming because we've done it before that if we took the time to make sure all these measurements were correct on our brackets and we transferred those measurements correctly onto our post and used our story pole that everything is where it should be and when we put it up it'll line up it won't be perfect and I say that because you know when you go up these posts they might move around just a little bit so it's got to look straight but it probably has, if you were to put a string line up this post, you know, it might go an eighth inch each way. And so when we put this together and we try to line up the edges of our boards, there might be a little persuasion that we have to do prying and pulling and using leverage to get them to line up perfectly. But I have faith that when we stand it up, these girts that are coming across and these girts that are coming across, they're all gonna weave together and it's all gonna be perfect. It's one stout little header though. Now for efficiency purposes, we always frame up the outside of our wall and then we flip our header over and put all the interior framing as well. And this really adds to the efficiency. Uh, anytime you can do the work on the ground, everybody's gonna be a lot happier than working in the air later on.
Now there's a lot of times where we'll just stand these posts by hand. Uh, but as I get older, I, I'm realizing that that is what machinery is for. These things are doable. You can do it, but I don't want to keep doing it. Uh, or I take that back. I want to keep doing it, so I don't want to get hurt. Therefore, always, always, if possible, use the machinery. That's what you have it for. That's what it's for. It never has a sore back in the morning, and you will. So as you can see, we do have all of our wall framing up on our three walls. So we don't ever do the front wall until our trusses are done. So when we come back, we're gonna go grab a bite to eat. Gotta keep the body fueled. And when we get back, we're gonna start prepping for trussing, which means we've gotta mark our trusses out. We gotta lay out all the purlin location, wind tie locations on those trusses, on the ground when it's nice and convenient can be efficient and then we'll start hanging them. I'm a little anxious because we haven't brought the scissor lift inside the site yet and we're hoping it doesn't get stuck, but uh, we know the telehandler will go through it. We've been there already. So when we get back, we're gonna start marking up this monster pile of trusses and can't wait to hang them. It's always the best part. Well, there you go, guys. The three walls are up. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hope you learned something. If you didn't, if you're confused, if you got questions, you know you can drop them down below in the comments. Um, I will definitely respond to every comment if possible. Just make sure that you guys hit that subscribe button if you like in the series so you don't miss out on the next ones, which means also you should hit that bell so you get that notification when RR Buildings posts another video. I appreciate your guys' uh, patience. I missed Wednesday's upload but these videos are a little bit longer and therefore require a little bit more editing so let me know if you guys would rather have two videos or just one longer video that maybe has a lot more content in it but stay tuned because next time we'll be back and we'll be hanging trusses